We are now being joined first from Arise Abuja studio by Uma Odi, who is convener of the Situation Room, and also here with us in the studio, uh, Fusika, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and Kemaso Ode Wodo, another lawyer and Senior Advocate of Nigeria, who is joining from Yenagua Bayes Estate. Feels great to have all of you with us. Thank you for joining us. Well, Maori, uh, let me start with you. Um, you are part of the Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room, and that body already issued a statement uh, yesterday scoring INEC low in terms of the management of the electoral process. Uh, what did you observe as somebody who was on the field uh, monitoring the election? And if you could take us through the main highlights of that uh, statement by the Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room. Maori, are you with us? Hello? Maori, can you hear me now? Sure. Can yes, Maori, if you heard me, please go ahead. I wanted you to take us through that statement by the Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room issued yesterday, scoring INEC low in terms of the management of this uh, election and the various glitches uh, that were observed. And your own observations as someone who was out there on the field as an election observer. OK, yesterday we just issued another press release now, Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room, which is also in line with what we issued yesterday. Uh, yesterday, we went to observe, I have to start from my point before coming to uh, Nigerian Civil Society Situation Room a report from across the country and our network of observers. We went round before it, we went to so many, uh, we went to over 20 pulling units in the morning before 8.30. We didn't cite any INEC personnel or material. It was when we got to Kabusa registration area that we saw many INEC uh, vehicles riding to, to go to their pulling units. And we saw a pulling unit uh, of INEC in that Kabusa registration area that has 1916 registered voters they have their materials they have their personnel but they didn't bother to even set up and when i i, I was uh, snapping pictures of what was going he said please madam leave here i said i can't leave here you are here you refuse to start i have to make reports to to Nigerian civil society situation and even while we were complaining of abuja the situation of Southeast was so bad that at the point we issued the release, only 6% of entire Southeastern Nigeria were annex personnel and materials were deployed to only 6% um, areas, uh, pulling units. And the, the worst is that the Okpala uh, Avenue, that is opposite, opposite uh, annex office in Enugu, there was no annex personnel, no annex material, till up to 11 a.m. And even 12 p.m. in the midday. So, and we don't know this. And you, the sub, that this annex, called, uh, this is the worst election I have observed since 1999. I've never seen the things I saw yesterday in the field. When they come late, the personnel, they first of all take their time to post things, post things on the wall. After they will take another time to come and do voter education for voters who have been waiting since 7 a.m. Say how you will queue, how you will vote. After they have finished explaining, then they will start accreditation if the beavers is working. The next thing they will say, ink has finished. And this is the most expensive election, almost a trillion. Not even the money from donor agencies. And we cannot understand or explain what happened yesterday. The emergency rule would rule a set. And I never knew that we have to come to a time in our lives that when it will rule, will, who is even a reproach and a byword in Nigerian electoral system will become a set. Yesterday it happened. Yesterday it happened. By 12, a former NLC president were calling situation room that in the whole of Medjugorje, they didn't cite 
and a call personnel. At that point, they were going from pulling units to pulling units. The same call we were receiving all over. People were even saying, what can we do? And people, and the most significant thing that we witnessed yesterday is the people. Nigerians came in the southeast, despite the threats of insecurity. They came as early as 5 a.m. And they sat there. Many of the people started going there around 12, uh, 2 p.m., 2.30 p.m. When they were supposed to have closed, that when they started going in pockets of places. If I will send the report which just issued, 13, host, 13 states, many of the pulling units were, they didn't even see our next personal materials till the end of yesterday. And we are, uh, that is where our observers observed. Because we have only 2,520 2, observers um, from our network of observers. But we have 196 point uh, pulling units. So many of those places that we don't have observers. We don't even know what happened there. So ANEC has to give us, compile the list of the pulling units across the country where they didn't organize the election yesterday or where talks disrupted the elections so that they will organize the elections in those pulling units because Nigerians cannot be so changed. And this is the limit we will have. Enough is enough. We can't have a woo 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 in 21st century. It's not possible. Thank you. But, Uma, Uma, you talked about the uh, Situation Room report. There was a preliminary report yesterday. You said the Situation Room has just released another report. Are the details of those two we reports just different from just, the accounting I just left given? the press conference. Excuse me? No, with this time around, we gave details. This time around, we gave details of the happenings at different places. Thank you, ma'am. Let's bring this conversation into the studio. Fusika, you know, Maudi just said that these are the worst elections that she's experienced since 1999. And observers have certainly come out with reports that are damning on INEC. What are your thoughts on the handling of the election process um, from INEC not showing up to certain polling units to Beavis as well, um, not working properly and allegations or rather statements from INEC officials coming out to say that they cannot upload Beavis results to the electoral violence that was witnessed in many parts of the country yesterday. How would you assess the handling of the 2023 elections? Well, I, I think that it may be, I don't want to speak for INEC, I don't, I mean, but it may be too, appearance sometimes don't uh, reflect uh, the reality. INEC is not the only player in this uh, election. Uh, and I think Dr. Abati, who, you know, had a foray of some sort into it, would uh, confirm some of these things. See, Nigerian politicians are very, very crafty. You know, earlier on we were told about uh, a pulling unit without um, a pad, you know, ink pad for people, two persons that are supposed you know, handling about a thousand people. I would want to believe that in the normal in, in normal thing normal course of things, INEC would have provided those materials, would have made arrangement for um, personnel. It, I mean, it's, 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 it's unthinkable to think I would, I never would not have done that. But you know, our Nigerian politicians, they do a lot of, um, a lot of um, pulling. Oh. And they, they know where they have strengths, where they have weaknesses, and so on and so forth. And as they are planning to win, they are also planning on what to do if things do not uh, go out well for them. Uh, I'm not saying that is, uh, that was what happened. But don't rule out situations where you know, Nigerians like us who were supposed to go and conduct elections will fall under the influence of some other persons and say, please don't turn up, you know, don't just go there. So to create a confusion, uh, Nigerians who are supposed to be delivering on this uh, INEC mandate will be told, okay, maybe they know how many minutes it takes for somebody to vote. So if you have 1,000 voters in a polling unit, for instance, you need so a number of hours. They simply influence those people to say, don't turn up by 11, go, uh, don't turn up by 8.30, go there by 12, you know, or one o'clock or whatever. Or if they cannot uh, achieve that, they say, okay, just say you don't have ink, you don't have pad, you don't have this, you don't have that. So uh, INEC alone cannot ensure free and fair. I, I'm, not, I'm not, they could do better with their, what's it called, but 
they alone need the co they need the co I think needs the cooperation of every Nigerian to you know deliver free and fair elections. And that's all this talk about um, you know uh, uh, structure and so on and so forth. We talk of about people earlier before you came in in worry. You saw a situation yeah. where people are gathered saying we want to vote, and they are being told that voting had taken place, you know, already in that uh, in that place. Um, our politicians they practice uh, uh, democracy, but they really don't believe in it. They will do anything to make them win. I think what INEC should do going forward is to find a way to remove their own system completely, if it is possible, from having to use state structures. You know, because when they come to a particular state, they, they cannot create their own uh, fresh air, uh, whatever. Maybe they bring in NGOs. I don't know how it's going to be done. As long as you continue to rely on the state to support you, you cannot, you know, have a seamless uh, process. These are states that since 1999, when they conduct local government elections, you see what happens. If there are 36 councils in a state, the party in power will win 36-0. You know, if, there are, if you have uh, 1,000 councillors, the party in power will win all the 1,000 councillors, no other person. The only time we have semblance of election is actually when you have the federal, you know, federally organized election. But uh, it's aspirational. You know, we can only try to see, you know, it, it's the only, right now we can't, we can't, uh, the only way to determine legitimacy of people in government is through this uh, process. And with all these problems and all that, that's the only way it's going to be determined. We can't resort to um, road transport workers using whatever to change leadership or any other way. So we just have to take what is there. But the important point to make is that it is not, whilst INEC will be blamed for this, for not, uh, it is almost impossible for you to sit to, I, I really don't believe it, that INEC will say, go and conduct election, no part. It's not possible. It's just manipulation by some people trying to, maybe they have access to those officials and they just told them, okay, this is what we want you to do and so on and so forth. You see ballot papers, they've not even counted, thrown away somewhere. You know, it's Nigerians that are doing it. You know, so would INEC, unless there is a way INEC would discern when you come, want to use you as a, an official, then, you know, to determine whether you will do your work the way it's supposed to be done or you are going to be susceptible to all manners of uh, influence, on patriotic uh, influences here and there. Okay, I, I, see, I see Mr. Kunle Adegoke has joined us. Mr. Kunle Adegoke, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Now, very quickly, uh, yeah, Mr. Adegoke, I would like to ask you this question. The uh, Electoral Act talks about open secret balloting. In section 122, it talks about the requirement for secret voting. But in this election, yesterday, we saw quite a number of uh, prominent persons after voting, they not only brandish uh, to advertise the party that they voted for, they were even taking photographs and even announcing how they voted. Now, under section 122, subsection 4 of that Electoral Act, we're told that, that, that that's illegal and that the person who does that is liable to 100,000 naira fine or three months imprisonment or both. And the persons involved here will include the president of Nigeria himself, President Muhammad Buhari, showing how he voted and posing for photographs. The attorney general of the federation himself, his pictures are all over the place showing how he voted. The governor of Benue State, Samuel Otom, uh, the uh, uh, Senator, Senator Ojuzo Kalu, I think I also saw his photograph. So what is the implication of this uh, for the integrity of the electoral process if prominent persons are the ones themselves violating the law? Right. Thank you, Doctor. Um, the, the, what, what transpired yesterday with respect to the individuals uh, you mentioned uh, is something that is not statutorily correct and it is wrong it is an offense under the electoral act for anybody whatever is the status of that person to vote and now display to the people or leak information about which particular candidate somebody else voted in this regard we'll see that what the president and the other people that you mentioned did is not only sanctionable it is criminal and it is something that is quite appreciated that they may want to show to people they want to please 
that they actually voted for them. I think assurances they gave earlier to such individuals should have been sufficient. And it is completely out of place if high-ranking government officials and notable eminent Nigerians are the ones that are seen perpetrating such a wrongful act that is not only violating the provisions of the Electoral Act, but it's equally setting a very wrong and criminal precedent that other people, less privileged individuals, may even want to copy. So what uh, the president did is quite objectionable. It is condemnable. He's only lucky that right now he still enjoys what we call immunity from prosecution under the Nigerian constitution. Such other individual, individuals who actually did it may have to be proceeded against immediately. But unfortunately, who is going to bail the cat in this instance? Now, who is going to guard the guards when the Attorney General of the Federation was even reported to have engaged in a similar thing? And that is where it is, it is pretty impossible to be able to proceed against these individuals for now. Probably after the expiration of their tenure, the appropriate authorities may have to take appropriate steps to not only condemn what they have done, but to equally make the people know that violation of any provision of the Electoral Act, it may not lead to the, to, to the, to the nullification of the election in that particular polling unit because we cannot nullify the expression of the people based on the heart of a particular individual that can be shown to have done something statutorily wrong. Where such an act cannot affect the result of that particular polling unit, we must still show it to be a deterrent to others by proceeding against such individual. Probably after May 29, the president may realize what he has done if the system is capable of writing such a wrong. And I think it is something that INEC will have to put in the cooler and be expected, will be expected to really take a step about. Otherwise, others will continue copying it. It is wrong. Mr. Adek, okay, thank you. Let's also bring in Kemaswa Dewodu, another lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria who's joining us from Bielsa State. I'd like to get your thoughts as well on um, the electoral process itself, how things have gone in Bielsa State, but first your comments on the, the breaking of the electoral acts that we've seen by government officials um, when voting yesterday. What are your thoughts on that? And then what are your thoughts on how the process has gone in Bielsa State as many people in the state will be voting today uh, rather than yesterday? All right, thank you for the question. First, with respect to the Electoral Act, the breaking of the provisions of Section 122 of the Electoral Act, it's clear that voting is secret and no other person should know who one has voted for. So that's a clear breach of the provisions of the Electoral Act. Then, with respect to the elections in Bayesa State, they had very serious challenges with distribution of electoral materials. I don't know what happened, but at least in five wards in Yenegua, elections could not take place. They are taking place now as we speak. I think that in, their, in the organization of the election, they had a lot of technical and logistics problems. These are issues which they will need to address. Then another issue which is of uh, serious importance to me is the voting process itself, particularly the accreditation. The Electoral Act, as in, I think, 47, 47 of the Electoral Act, 1, 2, and 3, provided that accreditation should be by means of smart card reader or any other technological device. And INEC has introduced the BVAS, which it has used in two previous elections, that's uh, these by-elections, and then which is using now. So with that provision of the law, there's no room for manual accreditation with the use of the hard copy of the voters register. It takes time. I saw on TV where voting took place at about 2 or 3 a.m. in some states. And that's because 
in addition to accreditation with the use of the beavers, they are also accrediting manually using voters register. And it takes time to look at the voters register, confirm the name, identity, card numbers, face of the voter and ticking it. it takes a lot of time. And that is a process which we have moved away from in the new Electoral Act of 2022. It was the system before, but it's no longer the system. So INEC would need to do away with it. INEC has included these provisions in paragraphs 19, E, 2, and 3 of its guidelines, and which, as far as I'm concerned, are illegal, because by virtue of the provisions of Section 47 of the Electoral Act, where the beaver's machine does not work, the election should be postponed. They, they can't even resort to manual accreditation by use of the hard copy of the voters' register. So when there's no provision enabling the use of the hard copy of the voters' register for process of accreditation, INEC, I think, is wrong to use that uh, manual accreditation to delay the process, which led to a lot of problems. Of course, if election is going on and taking place in the night, it presents a lot of problems. So for purposes of the next set of elections, I think we need to re-examine the accreditation process. So that, because if they're using only the beavers, it shouldn't take time. The, if they are spending 10 hours for accreditation and voting with just the beavers, it will take only a short while. Because the, the way it is now, since even the voters' register is not recognized by the Electoral Act for purposes of accreditation, it can't even be used in court. So of what use is the voters' register that they are bringing in to delay the process? So I think there's no need for that. Well, thank you, uh, SCN. Let me uh, come back to you, yes, Maudi. Earlier on, uh, you gave us a general impression of what you saw and also the report by the uh, Civil Society Situation Room. But I observed something. It will appear as if why the report of the Situation Room is close to that of IAGA, which is also an observer uh, group monitoring the election. The uh, Center for Democracy and Development seems to have a slightly more positive approach uh, in terms of assessing the election in their own preliminary report. Is it possible that the various observer groups observed different elections and re arrived at different conclusions? I would like to ask you that. And the second thing is about the loading, the uploading of results to the uh, INEC uh, IREV, what INEC calls IREV. We were told that by 11.35 yesterday, INEC was already uploading results. But by 7 a.m. this morning, some people reported that INEC was no longer uploading, and whatever INEC uploaded overnight or yesterday night had disappeared out of about 20,000 uh, results uh, that was, you know, uh, uh, submitted uh, yesterday after the end of uh, polls. Do you have any information in this regard about the uploading of results? Okay, um, after I spoke, somebody from that end were trying to defend INEC. Actually, would have loved to defend INEC because when I saw, when we saw Beavers and Electoral Act of year 2022, we were overjoyed. And when we followed that number of uh, 6th of November year 2021, when we saw result uploaded on time in uh, Oka, and when we followed to a kitty, ju uh, 18th of June, year 2022, and July of Oshun State Governorship election, by midnight, by 9 p.m. actually, the results are over 98 percent have been uploaded in Oka with all the security challenges in Oekiti, in Oshun last July. Then the person defending INEC, is it a compromise INEC personnel? that made ANEC not to approve the result of elections of yesterday. So I just want to put the questions on the table. Because you can defend ANEC all you care. But the things we saw in the field yesterday, and we were getting reports, even those from who are not our observers, 
thinking that there is a way we can help them. And we were calling INEC, we want to escalate the issues. They were not picking calls on, on like in the past when they do. So we can defend INEC. When INEC did well in Osho, we didn't hesitate to defend them. When they operated the result to their result portal, we did not hesitate to defend them. But when you saw what went on yesterday, are you still to defend INEC? You are enemy of Nigeria. And you are and the observer groups that are observing and thinking they are protecting INEC. They are Yahoo Yahoo observers. Excuse and because me. they do not know that this democracy costs blood. Ma. I said they are Yahoo Yahoo observers. No, are yes. you talking about CDD? I specifically okay. mentioned Center for Democracy and Development. Are you calling them Yahoo Yahoo observers? Whether it's, whether it's the, the CDD that is even partnering with Arise or other observer groups, any observer group that says, no, Yannick performed well with any grammar they use on it, it's a Yahoo Yahoo observer. It's a, because we saw re reports from uh, citizens themselves, and we saw citizens who come out to vote who went back home after 9 p.m. without see, starting an egg or materials across the country. And you now come and see that you that didn't even visit any polling unit. I say everything was okay. I make you know tried and others. Okay, is it how we we came here? The people who formed the first observation group, transmit tra, tra, TMG, were those who fought for democracy. It wasn't cheap. It was gotten by the blood of Nigerians in the streets of Lagos. And people who are looking for whom to endorse and call themselves observer group. And comes that observing Fanek for government, for political parties and candidates. And come after seeing what people went through yesterday. With all the crisis of no money and insecurity, kidnappings and everything happening. And you have confidence to say that you, that this INEC performed. Ah, you are enemy of Nigeria. And my Bible told me in the second book of Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 6, God, it is a righteous thing unto God to repair with tribulations them that trouble us. How can you confidently say that the thing that happened yesterday, in my pulling units very close to Sun City in Abuja, they were voting till 9 p.m. They were voting. It was even this morning we saw results. Our observers slept in the pulling units in Abuja. And you have confidence to say everything is all right. Then there is something wrong with you as a person and as a group. There, there is something fundamentally wrong with you. So I am actually saying it's not only CD. Any other mercenary group or Yahoo Yahoo group that said Arek did well yesterday. And Arek, you did not do well. You are a big disappointment. You need to do well in this election, uploading of election result. Because that is what will determine whether we will accept this your result or reject it. Because okay. we have been in the field. We have been, we fought for this democracy. We cannot allow anybody or institution to come and take us for a ride. We are not jokers. We have to, we fought the military without anything. We will fight Anik. We will fight Anik. We cannot take it. So the other one, want, they even have no their result. Suddenly they create this up to go and manufacture their own. Whatever they are doing, we are watching. And our we press conference this morning centers also on this uploading of results. Many of their personnel refuse to even upload the result or press it according to the law. The law says you must press it. They refuse to press it. And is it a political party that bought them? Nobody bought them. The way they were behaving yesterday was the, they are somebody that yeah, they was calculated, the inter, well intentioned, uh, organized crime to ensure that. Citizens are denied their vote and voice. And okay, voices. ma'am. We'll come back That's to you shortly. That's what I saw yesterday. And many people saw it in the field yesterday. We'll come back to you shortly. And let's bring that conversation now right here into the studio because it was you, sir, who said that INEC are not um, fully to blame here. And um, so allegations here are being leveled against you. And I'd like us to address that because INEC had four years to prepare for these elections. INEC had four years to prepare for these elections and the issues that observers have brought to our forefront are not issues that we can take lightly or joke around with at all. There are people even here in Lagos State, our reporters covered certain polling units where people arrived before 2.30 p.m. but were still told that they couldn't vote. There are serious issues here. What is your take and how would you I, respond I, to I, that? I think uh, Ma got it all uh, wrong. Um, I didn't say what happened didn't happen. 
Uh, in my earlier, I've been here earlier this morning and I've made my analysis, what I observed and so on and so forth. Um, what I said, and I stand by, mm. is that uh, certain structures beyond thy neck, what these politicians and, you know, what they call structure, this person doesn't have structure, this one has structure, uh, have played a major role in bringing about what we have witnessed. If you, they do a lot of, like I said, they do a lot of pulling. If, for instance, these political parties, if they believe that uh, a particular area, um, maybe the voters there, they suspect the voters in that area, you know, there's nothing, no matter what INEC put in place, they will go there and sabotage it. But shouldn't INEC be well prepped enough to be able to stand up against any structure that could try and ruin the elections, shouldn't INEC, especially as an independent commission, be above that? Be yeah, above. You see, it, an example was given. Uh, some electoral officers went to a polling unit without uh, ink pad. Some went without resource sheets. That should tell you, those are not accidental happenings. Yeah. You know, some, you, ask, you know, your mandate is to get to the polling unit by maybe 8.30 or whatever. You are getting there by 12. Are you responsible? These are not accidental occurrences. There are people behind all this, making sure, because they've done their calculation. And you see when the results begin to come out, even those of us that succeeded in voting, and then you have the results at the polling unit, oh, this is what was announced at the polling unit. We are seeing videos now, I don't know how far it's true, so I should be careful of, uh, you know, tipping of election, mat yeah. electoral materials, and so on and so forth. Even those of us that believe we had cast, we, we succeeded in casting our vote yesterday, and we have uh, results, you know. Nigerian politicians are not Democrats. That's the truth. You cannot practice democracy where the, 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 the so-called politicians don't even believe in it. All they see is that they want to get to power. You compare their behavior here with, say, I'm not trying to lionize them. They have their own issues. You know, would Trump still not be president today if he were in Nigeria? You saw Republican, you know, officials resisting him, telling him this democracy, there is a limit be, uh, be, uh, a debt be, be, be below which we will not go because election, you must, you must, you must uh, hold electoral process sacred. You must believe in one man vote, one man, one vote as democracy if you are a, for, for the system to work. These people are not interested in that. They are only calculating how are we going to sabotage, how are we going to ensure that we win. So I'm not like I said, at the end of the day, the blame goes to INEC. INEC, like you said, should have done their bit to understand that these things happen and see how it's going to be, uh, how they can work around it and ensure that the right things are done, you know. But the success or failure of any election is not dependent on INEC alone. That's the point I've made. Somebody will go to a polling booth unit and say it doesn't have ballot, uh, it doesn't have thumb, the most important, you have to turn print and all that, it doesn't, it doesn't have it. It's not accidental. It's organized, it's planned. That's what I'm saying. Okay, Mr. Adigoke, let me uh, come back uh, to you. Uh, very quickly, there have been complaints, particularly by the Labour Party, that you know, the party's logo was omitted in the uh, National Assembly elections in Lagos and also in Ondo State. And the uh, INEC chairman, during his preliminary briefing yesterday, said space, space had been provided on the ballot paper uh, for people to just write in in case of any omission. But the Labour Party has issued a statement calling for the cancellation of elections in those places where the logo of the party was uh, uh, omitted, considering the fact that the Electoral Act again emphasizes the logo of the uh, party. What remedies do you think are available uh, to those parties, particularly the Labour Party, that has protested? Yes, it is uh, a fundamental um, cardinal principle that what is used to represent a political party is the logo that stands in for that party on the ballot papers. Where the logo of a party is missing, and since we all know we are not using pictures of the candidates, definitely that party is omitted in the ballot papers. I got information concerning this allegation early in the morning yesterday. Although in such places where in Oshun, for instance, where we uh, got that uh, piece of information, we tried to 
investigate and we discovered that in such places, uh, maybe House of Reps and what have you, uh, there weren't candidates for some political parties that were raising such a claim. But with respect to maybe presidential candidates, we all know that it is not possible to say maybe Labour Party or a party that has fielded a candidate doesn't have a candidate in this particular election. And where the logo of the party is missing, the best is for INEC to treat such a particular unit, a particular constituency. For instance, if it is, uh, let us say, uh, a red or a local government, for instance, or something of that nature, then the main thing is to treat the election in that particular area as not conclusive and may have to be uh, done all over. And the INEC, uh, the Electoral Act, has provided opportunities for certain instances where election may be postponed. For instance, where the uh, Beavers ma uh, machine is malfunctioning. It doesn't say just go ahead and complete it and then announce results. It says the election, if no other Beavers machine could be brought uh, by till the end of voting on that day, then voting in that particular unit will have to be postponed till the following day. I think we have to treat such centers where the ballot papers did not reflect the logo of Labour Party or any other political party. It is not only for us to show that INEC is uh, trying to be fair alone. It is to project to the people, to the masses, that the electoral process is held in a very respectful and respected manner. Where we violate the electoral process by INEC committing to do what it is statutorily and constitutionally obliged to do, we are not projecting an image of an unbiased umpire to the public. And the people will be losing confidence in the electoral process. The danger there is that people will be taken to violence, which is not in accordance with the principles and tenets of democratic change. So I believe the best INEC can do in such units is like this thing. We, we still have a few number of days within which election in polling units or constituencies where elections will not be held will have to be conducted all over so that results in such places will not be announced Right now, there won't be any return, for just like a polling unit where Beaver's machine does not work. There won't be a return for such polling units or constituencies, as the case may be. And then when the election is reconducted, the results will come out, will now be added to others. And in the next few days, the results in such places will come out and we will have a complete result by which the winner can be declared. Where somebody is still not satisfied, another remedy is for such a party that is not satisfied with the outcome of the election to proceed to the election uh, petition uh, tribunal where all allegations, grievances, and what have you can be tabled before the panels and then the legal process will take its course. So I believe that there are remedies for such a party that is complaining of non-compliance with the provisions of the electoral act. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wadu, let's come back to you. And I'd like to switch the conversation up a bit now and speak about the possibilities of a runoff. Um, many believe that these elections are still too close to call. For the sake of our viewers, can you walk us through what that scenario would look like if we are heading towards a runoff, first of all? And secondly, what your thoughts are on that possibility? All right. First of all, uh, I, would, I think that the way it is, where we have about three or four serious candidates with possibilities of winning the election, I think that there could be a runoff. But what the Constitution calls that runoff election is second election, in fact, second and third elections. The provisions of Section 134, particularly 2, specify the circumstances under which a candidate, a presidential candidate, can be declared winner of an election. And the first is that the person must have the highest number of votes cast in the election. And secondly, the person must have one quarter of the votes cast in, one, in two thirds of the states of the federation. And three, the person must have one quarter of the votes cast in the FCT. I have listened to conversations where arguments have been made that the, in respect to F FCT should be considered as part of the states, and in which case the candidate to be declared winner should have two-thirds of 
the sorry one quarter of the votes in two thirds of the states, including FCT, thereby making FCT the 37th state. That argument, with the greatest respect, is not plausible. The Constitution specifically says two third, uh, one quarter of the votes in two thirds of the states and FCT. So the candidates must have one quarter of the votes in FCT. The Constitution. As mentioned in section three or four, one of those sections, the states and main listed all of them out of the federation. And FCT is not one of the states of the federation. So it cannot be computed as part of the states of the federation. And then in any case, if you want to use it as part of the states of the federation, how do you compute two thirds of 37 states? We'll go back to 23, two thirds of those arguments that were conversed in election tribunals in 1979. So it's very clear. So if no candidate meets those constitutional requirements to be declared as a winner of the election, there will then be a second election. That is section 134, 3, and 4 of the Constitution. And that second election will be between two candidates the first, there's no problem, very clear, which is the person with the highest number of votes in the election. There's no problem with that. But the problem is with the selection by INEC of the second candidate. And what the Constitution provides is that the second candidate shall be the person with majority of votes in the highest number of states. That's in the first instance, there are some other complications. So who is a person with majority of votes in the highest number of states? It talks about spread, not necessarily the person with the highest number of votes. Let's take, for instance, maybe candidate, apart from the, first, the person that has the highest number of votes, who is the first candidate among the remaining candidates, let's say candidate B has 20 million votes and he got the 20 and he has majority of votes, let's say, in 15 states. Then candidate C has 18 million votes and has majority of votes in 21 states. It, the, the person to be chosen as a second candidate will be the person with the lower overall votes, but who had majority of votes in more states than the first person. So the person who got, in the first instance, I think it's 20 votes, 20 million votes, then the second person, uh, sorry, the first one, 21, 20 or 21, the person with the lower number of total votes will be the person that will be chosen. And then there's also something else, and that is a difficult process because most Nigerians will not understand it. It requires a lot of enlightenment to, to say that the person who got maybe the second highest number of votes overall cannot be the second candidate in the election. It requires a lot of explanation. And at that cost to address a couple of uh, fora in respect of this issue, at least like two weeks ago, I called for an urgent amendment of the Constitution, which is necessary and very important. And to make it the, make it such that the second candidate will be the person with the second highest number of votes. It doesn't end there. The, the same constitution goes further and says where two or more candidates have equal majority of votes in the highest number of states, then the person with the highest number of votes in the election, excluding the first candidate, will then become the second candidate in the election. Question, is it possible that two or more candidates can have equal number of votes, sorry, can have equality in terms of majority of votes in the highest number of states? Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Take this scenario for instance. Candidate A has high majority of votes in 15, in 10 states. What is majority of votes? It has nothing to do with totality of votes. It means having majority of votes in states. And then candidate B, let's say also, he has majority of votes in 10 other states. In that scenario, 
there's equality. And in that situation, then the person, the candidate, not just between these two, but the candidate with the highest number of votes as between the remaining candidates, excluding the first candidate, who is already the first candidate, would now become the second candidate. This is quite complex because in the first scenario, that person with the second highest number of votes may have been excluded because uh, let's assume that it did not have the required spread. So let's say the first candidate who is the first candidate got to overall maybe 30 million votes. The second person got 30 million votes but without the spread. And candidates C and D had spread and they are equal. When once they are equal, it is now goes back to that second candidate with the second highest number of votes, and E would become the second candidate. All these provisions are complex. What they would have done simply was to say the person with the second highest number of votes will be the second candidate. And then in the second election, there's also a requirement of spread. All those requirements that applied in the first instance will also apply in the case of the second election, which are that the person must have the highest number of votes, two, the person must have one quarter of the votes in two thirds of the states, and three, one quarter of the votes in the FCT. It is where also in the second election, no candidate meets these requirements that there will be a third election and in the third election, the person with the highest number of votes becomes the winner of the presidential election. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Raised by Uli Sagbakuba, SEN, who had in fact asked uh, INEC to clarify uh, the uh, import of uh, Section 134 of the Constitution that you just commented upon. But we'd like to thank you very much, Wudu SEN. We'd also like to thank you very much Mr. Kunle Adewe Goke, SEN, for joining us. Can I us. just make a brief comment on it? Okay. Can I make a brief comment on it? Yes, Briefly. please. Go ahead. Yes. INEC has already made a mistake, a grave mistake in this regard. They included in paragraph 64 of its regulations and guidelines for these elections that where there is a tie in the presidential election, as they call it, when two or more candidates have the same number of votes, as they say in, in uh, paragraph 64, then INEC is authorized to conduct a fresh election. That is not in consonance with the provisions of section 134 of the Constitution, because what guides the conduct of the second and third elections are the provisions of the Constitution. So they need to go back, sit down with their lawyers, and let them be properly advised so that there won't be any confusion in this process. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kemasude Wodu, SAN, and Mr. Kunle Adegoke, SAN. Right.